in my province, the people are just busy surviving every day, every single day. Our life is just to survive. And another typhoon will come in the next few months and survive again. You know, it's difficult. So for me, I use the climate because for me, this is not a joke already. Our main industry is agriculture and then we are being disturbed by the unforeseen climate patterns or weather patterns. It's difficult. You know, we don't have other, we don't have manufacturing in our province. Tourism is also affected by climate change because if typhoon will come, then no, no tourist will come there. So it's a personal commitment having, uh, you know, my second life. For me, climate is a real thing. And I, I don't see any, any robust actions. We have a lot of papers. We have a lot of solutions and agreements and whatever there. But the problem is the execution, the implementation is really poor. So if we will not voice out, if we will not step forward, I think nothing will happen. Hello everyone, my name is Dean Long and welcome to the podcast Lifeline. In this podcast, I will interview people who are having a positive impact in their community and have a strong message that deserves to be shared. We will dive deeper into their journey becoming a change maker and hopefully you can take away some insights for your own journey. And please do subscribe to Lifeline on YouTube, Apple Podcasts or any platform that you are using. And also you can share this episode with your friends if you like it. It's really what helps me the most. In today's episode, you will meet Yan, who is an artist, climate activist, and survivor of Super Typhoon Haiyan that devastated the Philippines in 2013. He uses performing arts to raise awareness on the climate crisis, and he works to engage the art sector in climate negotiations. We discuss his first life as a civil servant at the Government Youth Council of the Philippines, and his second life dedicated to climate advocacy at grassroots and international level. At grassroots level, he founded Late Team to empower the youth from his hometown Leyte to take action for the climate. And at international level, he is engaged with Yongo to organize the Conference of Youth and make sure that underrepresented countries are around the negotiation table. Listen to him five minutes and you will understand that Yan is a fighter and a driven leader who just wants the best for his community in Leyte. Enjoy this episode and see you in one hour and 30 minutes. Yeah. Hello, Jan. I mean, Jan. I, I learned that your name is pronounced Jan. <laughs> you know, it's funny during the panel. Uh, Jasmine was texting me. How do we pronounce his name? <laughs> it's actually Jan if you, if you are taking it from the Western perspective. But I don't know, maybe the, some part of Europe, they, they pronounce J as Jan, as Y. Mm. So in a Western perspective, it's Jan and also in the Philippines. But when somebody called me Jan, I also like acknowledge it, depending from so where the, you are. So the, the Tagalog version is Jan, actually. We use American English, so it's Jan. Okay. I guess if you meet Spanish speakers, they say like Han. <laughs> Han, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, no, cool. I'm super happy to have you on Lifeline. Um, so yeah, like the first time we met was during a Zoom call. So actually, yeah, it was with Hita. I, I messaged Hita on LinkedIn because I wanted to know more about Yongo. And and yeah, I interviewed her actually on Lifeline a few episodes ago. And now you, so I'm <laughs> super happy. And um, and yeah, then we had another Zoom, I mean, not really a Zoom call, but you were a guest for one of the panel, so about youth and climate change. And yeah, I think on that panel, I was like, was well, this guy such a good speaker? And and then you told us, you know, it, I don't speak a lot. Uh, one of the first time I'm speaking, so I was like, whoa, uh, a lot of potential. <laughs> so I think... Yeah, I think on behalf of everyone, yeah, please continue to share a bit more, I think. Uh, yeah, and um, so, yeah, I think it's all, I mean, it's about this today. I wanted also, you know, to, I think, surf on this momentum. So to have you also share a bit more. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's so many questions I would like to ask you, uh, but we'll, I mean, we'll have uh, plenty of time. But uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll invite you if you want to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're calling from, where you're from, and what you are doing currently. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Dean Long, for inviting me here in uh, Life Lifeline, right? Lifeline. Yes. Yep. Um, I am Jan Kyrel Cabalona Guillermo. You can call me Jan. Um, I am from the Philippines, uh, specifically in Leyte, Eastern Visayas. It is the ground zero of the world's strongest typhoon uh, that ravaged the Philippines back in 2013. Um, but I'm currently based here now in Singapore, and I just finished my arts management scholarship in Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. So um, before I, I focused in the arts and climate intersection you know, industry, I uh, am active in political landscape. I was once a government official. At the same time, um, I am active in uh, you know, church activities in our community. And then when I was elected, I was uh, specifically focusing on youth development and um, representing our province to different events and uh, gatherings um, in, the, in the national level. And after that, overseas. So I think that's how to encapsulate, you know, introducing myself. Maybe we can dig in more later. Oh, yeah. Now we will dig into <laughs> everything you just said and even more. Um, so I have a strong feeling that this conversation will be a lot on climate change. So let's skip a bit climate change for now. But I think so basically before I have guests, I stalked them a lot, everything on Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> so I know everything. Uh, no, I think one interesting thing is I wanted to like, you know, when Many times when I, I, I speak with young people on climate change, I try to understand, you know, what was the trigger or how did they come into climate? In your case, I think it's very clear. I mean, there is a defining moment with Typhoon, Typhoon Haiyan. Uh, but I wanted to come to speak of about your life before that first, because um, you mentioned... You, you mentioned on your LinkedIn that you joined the government quite young. So I was wondering, like, when you were young, like, what... What did you want to do? Uh, did you always want to work uh, with the government? Uh, where did you grow up? Uh, like, I don't know, anything about uh, your childhood or your, your life before 2013? Right, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't even remember how I arrived in this age. Um, now that you're asking me, 2013 feels like just yesterday. And uh, yeah, so I think before that year, It is for me. It's not really uh, my my personal interest to be in the government, but I think because how how I wake up every day, every single day in 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 my house in in in, in the Philippines is, um, you know, people are always coming, and I'm always curious why we have a lot of guests most of the time. I mean, from from childhood, I don't understand that. Of course, I don't have the the understanding of this kind of of um, gatherings, and I just found out that we are actually a political family. So my my grandfather, my grandmother was once a legislator in our town. My mother, my my aunt, and then my brother was um, elected as well um, in the in the village council. So in the Philippines, we have this unique structure where youth is represented. We have the capacity to run. So we call it Sangguniang Kabataan, or in English trans translation, it's Youth Council. So we have that in the in the local and in the the the, the um, smallest unit of government in our in in our structure in the Philippines is the village or the barangay, means you know the group of um, households, and then go up, going up is the town or the municipality, and then the province. And then we have this state or the region and then the country. So in the village, we have youth council where you have your own funding. So growing up in, in these villages, you are always excited during summer. You have basketball you know, activities, sports activities, and a lot of social cultural happening. So you're always excited and you're always immersed. You're always engaged. Or sometimes if you're not involved, you love to watch, you know, you're ex so, ex so you're so excited for this kind of activity. So having said that, you know, uh, growing up in a busy ha house with guests and um, political figures and then this activity. So I have this in my, my, in my mind that someday I want to do that. So I think when the right age came, um, I think I was around 17, turning 18 at that time. I run for the village position. 
that the, the village youth council is composed of i think eight officials one is, one is the chair and then seven um um council members so i run for the the chair the chair position and then this villages in our municipality needs to elect one which will sit in the municipal legislative body so when you sit there you are also a councilor or a, a legislator policy maker so i run for that position again after winning in my village so i run in the municipal level i won and i was also elected in the provincial level as executive board so i was holding the finance the financial side so i was holding two kind of three positions village municipal and provincial so managing um i think in my municipality we have um 50,000 population and then province wide that's more than a million population yeah so so that's how i mean, i want you to to have a picture on on uh, the um that it's it's really real because uh, in other countries they have youth councils or organization but only very focused ours is really legit you will handle funds you will operate and um you will do projects you will do meeting sessions bills ordinances contracts so that's why we are if you can observe i think most of uh, mostly of the filipinos are are well aware of our situation in 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 society and we are immersed we are we are good speakers it's because of this platform so yeah that's how my life um in before 2013 and aside from the political thing my mother when she was seated as the uh, chair of municipal tourism council she was uh, leading the our we have this festival or like the mardi gras like in brazil this parade street parade so our town there is a provincial competition so our town it's like a big thing you know like um sending the number of dancers there more than hundreds of dancers and then the entire province is like a like a competition so everyone is excited about it and i'm always going to my, i mean i'm my mom will always bring me there and watch the the parade and you know sometimes i'm going to give water to the dancers so again this excitement this um upbringing to me uh, in in my in my, uh, as my environment gives me this idea of i want to be there or i want to be more uh, engaged in when when um when i will be uh older or when, whenever the right age will come for me so yeah i was in the arts already like i already have like a background at the same time the politics so that is my um yeah my engagement before typhoon changed my life so that's i mean it's really interesting uh well <laughs> i will spend a bit some time on that as well uh but so you became elected in between 17 and 18 but it sounds so easy i mean like you had to run a campaign i mean you needed to get votes from everyone right i mean how how did that happen yeah it's not easy because it's like a real election in the government like you have to convince people you have to to do house to house you have to be not, you know you have to project the best version of yourself because if you it's also like you know it's if it's an election especially in the local level sometimes it's the tension is there because it's it's like a competition of families so it's not only like an organizational level where you sit down and then you nominate and you elect no you have you you do posters and you do um uh it's more of marketing yourself selling yourself to the people what are your agenda what are your platforms for for the village and for the town so this is really like a serious serious thing in in the philippines and So so I, yeah I get I guess on on the village level you go door to door but on the munici- uh, I forgot municipality level like when you said like 1 million people like how do you get people's votes Oh no um for the municipal level um only the 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 chair of each village will elect okay. oh, and then okay. in the provincial only the municipal it's like the parliament um electing the prime minister something like that okay yeah and i mean i can imagine like when you are 17 18 and you do that i mean first not many people do that at such young age. you must develop like 
just enough 21st century skills for the rest of your life. <laughs> right, right. I think because um, when you are willing, when you are aware of this position, I think by the age of 14, 15, you are already excited to run. So in school, you are already active. We also have some, you know, student council elections. So you are you are kind of prepared already to be in that position. Well, sometimes some of the youth are not prepared. Like their their family push pushes their son or daughter, like go run, <laughs> go run for that position. But for me, I'm already engaged in, in in our secondary at that time. I'm already very active. In fact, before I run for the position, I was the youngest choreographer in in my province to to hold our local festival. So I'm already very immersed um, in terms of in being empowered and being skilled. I think I already have the, the capacity to, to run um, youth uh, in, in, my, in my community. I think the only, the only new thing for me when, I, when I'm seated there is the technical capacity because you're already engaging with legalities and actual documents. Yeah. Did you ever tell yourself whether it's to run for elections, whether it's to handle all the contracts and funds that, oh, I cannot do that, or you always, yeah, I can do it. I mean, did you ever doubt? Well, I think this is the same thing that I mentioned to you during our our um, previous program that youth sometimes, you know, they are willing. They are willing to do extra mile, but our gap is knowledge and skills. So I think I also realized during that age that I was super willing, I'm super eager, but I didn't know that I don't have the exact skill or the exact knowledge. So it's like a shotgun strategy. You are there, fire. So just do it. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that, okay, I have to sign documents, I have to sign you know, like you have to authorize the mayor, you are one of the signatory in, in the legislative council, authorizing the mayor to, to enter a contract project. I didn't know this thing. I only know the, my responsibilities when I'm already there. Like, okay, here's like, you know, a book of your responsibilities, read it, and then that's it. <laughs> I guess, I mean, it's such an important position. Aren't there like people who are here to guide you? <laughs> It is. It is an important position. You actually have a vote in in the in the council, so it's like um, a a real um, a, a real. It's more of like a, a a short term career because your your salary is the same as the other legislators, like mm. the, the the seniors. Yeah. And did you? I mean, so was it a full time position, or did did you go at university at the same time? Well, being a legislator, you only have to attend sessions every Monday for our municipality every Monday. And the rest are if you want to do programs, if you have other activities, then you can do it. So I was studying at that time. Yeah. Okay. And also studying in like with the mindset of I will continue in the government later. Well, again, before the typhoon, that was my idea, like. I, when I when I already experienced the you know um, like it's cool it's cool to be in the government you actually understood the complexities of of ad addressing the the problems in com in community it gives me a broader perspective that how I see it from a um, from a civilian perspective is different and when I'm there I, I was like oh my god this is this it's not it's not actually easy to to resolve a certain aspect on 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 based on your ordinary perspective. So I have this in mind, like I, I want to continue more because I, I felt like three years was short enough for me to, to do projects, programs, and activities. I, I wanted to do more. So in, but, in how old are you now? I'm turning 28, but feeling 17. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 28, so that was 10 years ago. So that was 20, okay, 2010, 2011, All right. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, there's... Um, Typhoon arrived at the, I mean, did you stop being in the government after Typhoon or did it just stop at that point? So the Typhoon was November 8th and we are going to step down 31st. So I still have three weeks before I step down as, uh, as, um, as a government official. Okay. Um, 
All right. Uh, no, cool. I think that's uh, really a part I didn't expect. I, I mean, good. I always, I've always seen Filipinos. I mean, at least the ones I know as like super active. And I never understood why, right? I mean, you know, I see people, young people in Bangladesh are like the most active youth I've ever seen, but I can explain this because there is Mohammed Yunus, Brak and stuff like this. In Philippines, you know, I, I tried to understand. I tried to see if there were role models, powerful role models. I, I found a few names, but were not as big as Yunus, you know, but I, I, I guess this is one piece of the puzzle as well in, in terms of, you know, I feel like it's cultural that young people, they are so engaged so active um cool so thank you for sharing that um and yeah i mean basically so 2013 like i mean it's how you introduce yourself each time it's the first sentence you say you are so i think yeah. i have a little bit of trivia the philippine government i think last year we have the because we have 44 uh, uh, on uh, how many villages in the Philippines is, is actually the same uh, councils, youth councils. So if we have 40,000 villages in the Philippines, we have 40,000 plus council, youth councils as well. And we have an allocation of more than $250 million for the entire youth councils mm -hmm. in the Philippines to spread across the country. So that's how... Aside from the fact that we have organizations in the community, in the, in the, in the schools. So this is only the political unit. So if you have to add everything, that's how, how empowered we are in terms of uh, um, youth engagement, youth empowerment in the Philippines. Yeah. Would you say that... Um, like how... Like, no, would people still miss it? I mean, I don't know how to, uh, but you know, would you say like every Filipino is like super active, super empowered? Well, it's not always a perfect system. Um, I can say that it's a yes and no, because for me, um, the Philippine constitution given us the, the space or the platform already, but of course, um, there are always gaps and challenges. There are issues that we face. But I think if the youth is, if the passion is in the heart, the usually the youth, the, the youth of um, the youth council president or the officials or the organizations is empowered enough to um, to run um, a good a substantial program. But not not all of us. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of um, the local youth, which are not immersed to this um, structure, I can say that. It's already up to them because ours, in our communities we have a lot of activities. Even though you are not an official, in our in our in the local level we have a lot of activities. So it's up to you. So sometimes it's more on. Sometimes it's uh, about family problems or sometimes your personal character. Like we, you don't want to be engaged. You you are just what I call this one, in intrapersonal. Mm. So I th I I I couldn't say. A, I couldn't say that I can generalize the entire youth as empowered youth, but I think I can say that I can I can pull off. I can be proud that a lot of Filipinos are competent enough at their young age to be in the platform, to be in the podium, to to tell their stories like me, to to um, share what are their good um, um, projects that they that they've done in the school or in in communities. Mm. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. I, I've never heard of that when it comes to Philippines. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll do more research. Um, but yeah, no, so like back to, I mean, back to uh, climate change. Uh, no, yeah, I think, I mean, what, what, you know, like the first time we had the meeting in, I guess, October, November, like six months ago, I still remember how you introduce yourself because you know it's very powerful the way you introduce yourself. I mean, to me, I didn't. I, I mean, I remembered. I mean, basically, like you know, yeah, I remembered survivor of typhoon and art sculpture for climate change. So I think it's you've done a good job. Um, but no, yeah, could you elaborate maybe on that? Like how how did your? I mean, obviously, the I mean, your life changed in many aspects. Whether it's you know infrastructure wise but also in terms of what you want to achieve but could you come back on that 
on the arts, right? On um, yeah, like how yeah, how, the, how mm, arts the and climate. climate change journey, yeah. Yeah. So as what I mentioned earlier, um, I'm super engaged with our local festivals, with our local um, events. So having this as a pass as a pastime in my childhood. So of course I have the ownership of uh, of the culture and the arts industry. Even though again I don't have yet the full grasp what is culture and the arts industry. I just know that I am dancing. I am um, doing this choreography and thingy, but I don't have the techni- uh, academic knowledge and that. So when the typhoon came and I was still in power, in, in, I mean, in my seat as, as the um, president in, in our municipality, I'm always looking for, I'm, I'm always trying to be inclusive, like, okay, we have programs for all other areas, but culture and the arts, sector was left unfunded so I felt like so where are we or you know do we exist or not because we are a sector we are not just a group of um, marginalized population we are a sector that um, or an industry you know entertainment industry culture and the art sector culture and heritage so I'm always looking for this for this um, opportunity like, okay, if we have funding for, for this, for the people who are working in the arts, I'm trying to look for information where I can access that support. So at least I can, maybe I can give housing support or maybe just food relief. But, but there are no specific programs for culture and the arts. So what I did is, of course, I came from the government. So I know how complex it is to resolve every single issue. So instead of complaining, instead of ranting, I know that nothing will happen because there are some priority areas why such programs are tailored that way. So instead of complaining, I step forward. I'm I'm even in my business administration at that time. So because of this ownership, like, okay, if no one is doing it, I'm going to do it. If no one else should, I will. Same thing I, I said in our um, program. Um okay, I, I'm going to pull off this industry or I'm going to help this uh, the people working for the arts sector and then, you know, um, fusing the, the theme of climate change, like how can I utilize us, uh, the arts as a medium to educate people? Because for me, I, I understand that if you are from a poor province, if you are from a developing region, if you are from a developing country as well, arts is not actually the priority list. I mean, even in other countries, arts is always at the bottom of the list when I, when it comes to funding, when it comes to development. But yes, we exist. We exist. Uh, the Philippine culture exists, but in terms of the support, we will of course prioritize the infrastructure because these are the economic drivers. You know, social welfare funding. So, um, I'm thinking on we have what we call the rule of attribution, like how can I utilize the government funds? So for example, if, they are, if we are talking about gender development because there's funding for gender and development, or let's say there are funding for climate activities. So how can I tap these resources, but utilizing the arts as a medium, as an entry point? Because if I will only talk about climate, or so, sorry, arts and culture, it would be really difficult because first, we don't have a formal uh, theater or we don't have a formal job positions for in, in our province for artists. Most of them are only gigs, you know, like um, pop-up events. Uh, okay, let's set up a performance and then we will be paid for that night or this event. We are not like, a, we don't have a paid job, a regular job. So I use the arts as an entry point while addressing these issues. So I can activate them even though we don't have a specific opportunities for for the art sector or for the culture and heritage. So that's how I, I came into, you know, I'm trying to maximize what we don't have in order to produce something that is revolutionary. So at you know at the same time, it's it's like um, worrying to know that the the digitalization the um, digital um, digital world this uh, fast-paced modernization or, um, you know, the globalization, the, the young people are not any more appreciative of uh, who we are. We, they don't even know the history of our town. <clears throat> they don't even know the why these dances or why these folk dances um, 
um, was uh, was I mean, came into life. So I need to continue the narrative because the the young the senior the senior leaders are are focusing on a on a bigger issues. So that's how I use the arts as okay. Um, uh, you don't have funding for this, but we have for this one. Let's try to merge. It's I think if you are uh, if you are a leader, if you are if you are a, a program, what they call this one. Um, if you if you do pro concept notes or project proposals, you know these areas, right? So that's how I, I activated. That's how I I use the arts as a, as a good way to to tell our stories and narrative. And then from there, little by little, um, governments are. Uh, mayors, governors, and other officials in the country are looking at our output. That this is good. So we start in the again in the municipal level. We try to to show our 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 capacity, and it's difficult, Din Long, because I don't have my at that time as an artist. It was a self-taught artist. I, I we don't even have in in our province um, a program or a degree course for arts management, for dance, or for, for music. We don't have that. You can only learn, or you can only have that degree in the capital of the Philippines, which is in Manila, one hour flight away from Leyte. So my, my cousin, who happened to be a scholar in the Philippine High School for the Arts, sending us videos. I don't know how to do, I don't know how to conduct dance classes. So she's sending me videos, like, okay, do this for the ballet. Um, training foundation so it's it's more of like trying to prove your worth but you don't have the capacity so you need to uh i'm like like a, a skill scavenger <laughs> trying to okay this is how to do it this is how to do it so but we what we managed to pull off so after the typhoon uh, 2013 i think by the year 2015 two years after we managed to get an international performance in vietnam that was our first overseas performance. But of course, before that, we won the national float competition. I was with my performers. Um, we were invited to several events in the province, again, with this narrative. I think our methodology is very unique. Like, um, again, if you sell culture and heritage to the young people, they won't be interested. Nobody will go to your program. So we need to think of strategies, like how can we make our youth participate? So, like for example, what we did for the biggest parade in Asia, Singapore. Um, I talked to the mayor, like um, Mayor uh, Honorable um, Ma Ma Rosario Masal Avestruz. Um, she is also very supportive in climate in in the arts. And then I introduced her. She was the first person to believe this methodology. Like Mayor, what if we will say to your youth, okay, we will go to Singapore. Of course, everybody's excited. If you are from the province, going to Singapore is like going to Mars. You know, you are, you are popular. Even for the first time I went to Hong Kong at the age of 18, I feel like I'm holy, you know, like I uh, John went to uh, Hong Kong overseas because again, we are poor. We are, we are poor um, people there. So going to abroad is a big thing. So our entry point was like, seducing them, sorry for this language, seducing them to say, we will be going to Singapore. So everybody was like super excited, but they don't know behind the real intention of the program was to actually educate them. So we locked them in, we gave, um, we, we had an agreement with the dancers like, okay, whoever will survive this six months program will be able to go to Singapore with us. So during that six months program, we infused what we want to do for the arts, for the climate. So we have this narrative, what is climate change? How can you do it? So we have these mini workshops, we invite speakers. And for example, we have this, what we call a local dance kuracha, which is um, a mimicry of, uh, you know, cockroach, or it's more of like a wedding dance as well. And then it's, it's really fun, it's our local dance. So. We teach them how to how to how to perform it properly, or let's say our tinikling, the bamboo dance, which is a mimicry of a bird um, trying to avoid this um, bamboo traps, bamboo traps. So we we tell them the narrative like this is the real story of this dance. At the same time, 
we try to infuse the climate narrative like you know being resilient and then explaining to them that um uh, this is our situation and this is how you can help so we put a, a, a development program in between rehearsals so let's say in the um let's say monday wednesday friday they will do dances uh, dance program weekends they have workshop we include we even included as asian in our topics we even included um biodiversity we even included how to write the the ancient writing of the philippines because they don't know how to read it they don't know how to write it so we try to infuse this program and of course it's it's uh it's quite strategic you really have to be engaging because your audience are youth and you need to be uh good in explaining to them like okay this is what you need so from there i think our story really um our our goals was achieved and when we bring these performers when we finally created the dance our costumes are well curated as well like uh we have an endangered species uh the visayan spotted deer so we put that in our narrative like we are putting this um for uh, um um what they call this one a fake fur to signify that we want to raise awareness about this endangered species so we put the the rice box to signify the our main um income in our province which is f- rice farming so we put the narrative in all what we do from the rehearsals from the workshops from the costumes and we we brought it to singapore and click we were in the newspapers because of that again because we don't we we um for me performing is is useless if you don't serve a purpose you know government or stakeholders won't fund you if it's only performing for the sake of per, if, if it's if it's a performance for the sake of performing because they can get the the, the best dance troops in the philippines they can get the bayani and they can get you know the famous dance troops but why is it us it's because of our of our intention it's because of our narrative it's because of our methodology and our objectives and of course i have a team of researchers i have um dr jonas villa so he's a phd in um research uh, assistant professor in late normal university i have denise who is um doing her masters in the community uh, communication development community development i think so yeah communication major as well so all of these ideas coming together from me i have the connections in the government uh, i have the passion for the arts we created this module we created this um, methodology and then pitch it to the to the government officials and then that's it same thing when we went to indonesia when we went to to vietnam but i think the most um uh, published work was the singapore So we were in the um, straight times with their national paper and of course aside from that again um because we love multifaceted approach so we we, we put there as well like the the headdress of the costume um like a golden sun representing the golden anniversary of the philippines and singapore so we 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 touched climate we touched biodiversity we touched um uh local context culture and heritage and we also touch diplomatic or bilateral relationship so this is how i think um um why i'm so passionate with this because we are not only educating people you know we are we are trying to pull the things that are usually being left behind you know the youth and this youth um what, I, what i'm always thinking is we always have the good youth uh, like perf- in terms of talents we 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 don't run out of talents in in the philippines but the problem is opportunities of course will only be given to those who are well known or to those who have good access to network so for me like when i brought these dancers i even have backlash like ah oh, their performance is so bad of course they are not that super professional i even have some dancers who are just new like super new so i i i i i invited professional dancers like um cliver to who competed in the one of the biggest ballet competition in the world he he is from late as well so i invited him like can you do a training to them and inspire them 
so this new knowledge this perspective you know if if it's well um well relayed to our youth they will not only learn but they will also create the ripple effect and i'm so happy that when we left they can now stand on their own they have their own dance troupe and they are um they they are very proud of what they've done you know so i i hope you know i mean of course again arts is really not that focus but it's on how you see the light in every darkness so that's how i i i um use the arts as a medium or as an entry point to address or to educate about the climate crisis that we are facing right now it's um it's interesting because i think when it comes to arts you know i think i, I mean it's very i think it's very clear why you know you choose art because you were emerged in arts like since so young and you also added you know all this like preserving cultural heritage i mean i think internally it makes sense but also externally in the sense that with arts you can touch the audience as well in a different way uh than with lectures or workshops about climate change um and i i find it funny because it, it's not something that you mentioned a lot you mainly mention more internally because you know you were in the art it's also um a good way to put a lot of things different topics but also to preserve the a lot of the culture of philippines but i think also for the audience i mean the, the fact that it's a dance show you will you can touch people's emotion uh when it comes to climate change and also communicate about climate change in a very different way than what usually we 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 learn about climate change i think uh, din long um that is on the local level in the let, let's let's put it in a global perspective i'm also quite depressed that we are um you know arts is everywhere in terms of communicating climate like you know um installations of paintings graphics design um whatever name name all of them we are arts is being um we are like the uh what they call this one we are one of the we are being used as a medium to communicate better because some of uh, i mean most of the people are not te- technical um reader sometimes what they see is that's it right so we, that's why we use the arts as, as a medium um we are not seated in the in the in 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 negotiation i can observe i mean being in yungo right now we are not there we are not we are not represented so i think for me my presence in yungo as well i always try to in- encourage them like hey um if if all of the sectors are represented we have the agriculture um we have biodiversity we have the oceans and uh gender and whatever so i hope the arts will be also given our chance to voice out because in terms of funding it's very rare to to see grants saying that you know arts and, and like this so for me i'm also advocating this in a global perspective like hear us not only not only because we can do beautiful uh, masterpieces art 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 crafts but because we want also to be involved so we are not there um of course again it's a process but um i think it's also because um uh, i cannot blame the, the 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 system because sometimes an, as an artist we we usually isolate ourselves like don't touch us or let, let's just do the the artwork and then that's it we we usually have this pride like of being um you know of our work we don't engage to polit- we 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 um artists are not really keen on engaging into this uh, like you know political but there are some so for me um i am the kind of of uh, arts manager i can say or artist that wishes uh, to be or wants to be involved in the process and wants to 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 contribute to whatever policy document or statement because i think addressing climate crisis is not a job of only one sector it's everybody should be involved everybody should be in the in the in the boat so i i felt like before we are only painting the boat but we are not included goodbye so this time we paint the boat we design the boat but we should also be 
in the boat with them. So that's how I see things in the global mm. perspective. Yep. Cool. Yeah, uh, so we'll come, definitely come back on this point, more on the global picture and also your role with Yongo. I, I, I first I wanted to, to come back a bit. I wonder, like, because you know, after Typhoon, I think there's many ways you can do something on climate change. I, want, I was wondering, why did you choose climate awareness, climate education? Right, because surviving that typhoon is really traumatic. Like I can only see the the af the, the aftermath in in what they call this one movies in films, you know all this uh, apocalyptic scene. But at that time I was there, anarchy, loot looting in malls, dead bodies on the streets. I already experienced it. Like for me. If you if you, if this is your second life, what will you, what will you do? So for me, it's a commitment. Like this is not only a theory; this is a reality already. And for us living in in Eastern Visayas, facing the Pacific Ocean, we are the first beneficiary, if uh, if if we may call it, we are the first victim that will that is um you know absorbing all the effects of climate change. Because the the what do you call this one, the typhoons are not anymore like the same as before. It's getting stronger and stronger. So if we will not act using our expertise, it could be you know. I I don't know. Um, even though if, even if my in in my province the people are just busy surviving every day every single day our life is just to survive. And another typhoon will come in the next few months and survive again. You know, it's difficult. So for me, I use the climate because for me, this is not a joke already. You know, if 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 your region is um, our main source of income is uh, our main industry is agriculture, and then we are being disturbed by the un, um, unforeseen climate patterns or weather patterns, it's difficult. You know, we don't have other. We don't have manufacturing in our province. We don't have other. Uh, well, tourism is also affected by 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 typhoon or by, by climate change. Because if typhoon will come, then no no tourist will come there. So that's why I I I think for me it's a personal commitment having uh, you know my second life. At the same time, just like the global movement, I think I am part of it. So. That's why I use I use the climate. I mean, I can I can I can uh, advocate for gender. I can advocate for other stuff, but for me, climate is is a real thing, and I I don't see any any robust actions. We have a lot of papers. We have a lot of solutions and agreements and whatever there, but the problem is the execution, the implementation is really poor. So if we don't, if we will not voice out, if we will not step forward, I think nothing will happen. So that's that's my idea on um, touching climate in my in my in, the, in in my passion in the arts. Did you consciously tell yourself, oh, "This is my second life. What do I want to do with it?" Yes. Okay. Um, no, it's uh, you know I speak with many people, and you know a good practice that I heard from people, you know, to meet their goals, objectives, and think about how I know they, they, they want to conduct their life is to either think, you know, when they are 80 years old, about to die, or when they're dead already, and then they can hear people at their, how, how do we say that? At, at, like in the graveyard, you know, at the part, not the party, but <laughs> the funeral. Um, or just before you, I interviewed someone who said he's writing his, I don't remember the word, but like death letter, you know, the testament. Um, so always, you know, writing in the future and, and coming back to the present. Well, do I feel like, okay, I mean, it's the opposite, but still similar. Like you almost died, uh, but now, okay, you didn't. You have your second life. So what do you want to do with it? It's, no, yeah, I was wondering like, if it's conscious or not, but it's um, okay. Uh, and yeah, 
like you spoke about the the papers and stuff on climate change. So, well, yeah, I, I saw that you represented Philippines at the COP21 in Paris. Um, how did that uh, happen? Like, did you were appointed, you were selected, and how was the experience? And how, what was it to say to everyone in Leyte that you were going to Paris? <laughs> No, I think because uh, I think the very the very first moment that I uh, had access to be there is because of Koi 11. So when I attended the Student Energy Summit back in 2015 in Indonesia, they have this booth saying that um, who we, who wants to be who wants to be there in Paris for this event. I didn't even know that Koi and COP exist, to be honest, at that time. So I went there and then. I had just signed up and then applied for for access to these events and then I I, I was there. So I was that's like so... <laughs> yeah that's how simple it is and then suddenly I realized oh this is a big thing. So yeah that was that was the sh very short story that I can say. But of course again go from a, a litenio or you know a villager coming to Paris is like going to Mars. So I moved a lot of mountains for me to be there because of, We are not funded, so I have I have to encourage our government. Like, I want to be there. I want to represent our country, our province, because we are survivors of typhoon, and I want to be involved in this kind of process. And from there, that's the history goes on, like being Yungo. Then, yeah, but I wasn't even aware what are they talking about at that time. I was just there observing. <laughs> Cop, you know, like the is it the green zone? Yeah. Um, koi. I was just like sitting there when I, when there's a workshop and there's a session. Okay, I'm gonna sit here, but I didn't because that was my first time to know about about um, climate negotiation process. I mean, I know that this exists, but I didn't know that we have the capacity to influence as a youth. So that's I always I'm telling to Yungo that even until now our communities doesn't know that Koi and Yungo exist. So my mission was to spread this information. That is my very first mission when I got the position as Koi Liaison, a Global Affairs Unit lead. Was the Koi and COP, did it change anything? Like how you saw your role in climate? What, what do you mean specifically by did it change? So, um, yeah, like, Because you know you 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 heard about COP or, or not and and don't really know what a climate negotiation and then you you are there you know at one of the most important climate negotiation so far observing. Now what do you tell yourself after like during this event and after this event? Oh yeah, I think that gave me a eureka moment. So it's like I I need to tell the I need to tell um my my other. Net network in in the Philippine government. I mean, especially the youth councils, because if they know about this, of course, we will be more immersed and we will put it in our agenda. Because in in again in the youth councils that I mentioned earlier, we have the capacity to design what we what projects do we want for communities. So can you imagine, Din Long, if these forty thousand youth councils will really focus on giving substantial projects for the climate and really educate? If we can activate this strong network funded youth network we can do more but the problem is again we lack guidance or if there if there might be guidance but it's not really enough they don't, maybe they don't, they don't have the grasp on what what are what will they do about it again they know climate change they know they know this exists but the process the yungo sitting in unf triple c they don't know this so for me Yes, it changed the way I I I I look or I understand better that there's actually negotiation happening, and that's the start of your young girl journey. It was, yeah. So it's been six years now that you was young girl. Can you could you briefly, I mean, so Hita explained about young girl already, uh, but I'll just explain in one sentence. Uh, so. Yeah, it's basically the official youth constituency of uh, UNFCCC, which is, in very simple terms, the UN Agency for Climate Change. So having said that, uh, could you briefly walk us through your journey with Yongo since 2015? 
Uh, in Yungo, I have this love-hate relationship. Of course, again, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was on and off. So active, inactive. Of course, I have my focus and when I studied here in Singapore as well. And um, 2015 to 2018, I'm just giving inputs on documents, consultations, attending meetings, but I'm not really immersed. Same as now, like I'm really, I'm, I'm leading um, people. I think the, this is the, mo the most immersive moment in Yungo for me, especially when pandemic hits, like, you know, like you're just in your room. The first thing that I, that it clicked me when they say call for uh, logo entries or logo consultation. So it opened my mind, boom. And then I reactivated myself and then suddenly I, um, we have what they call, we are preparing to, to pitch our performance to bring it to Koi. And then when we bring our proposal, they said that, Jan, I think your proposal is, is nice. You are more organized than us. Can you join the team instead? So I joined the team as a normal volunteer and suddenly they appointed me as the lead of global affairs unit. So that's, I mean, this is the most um, engaged uh, uh, position in Yungo. Last time I'm only like a normal member, like giving, um, inputs and contribute because I'm so busy like you know if you have the position in the government you are I have local projects and everything but this time it's really like doing really a, a, um, a, a real work in, in Yungo. So your position is basically making sure that the KOI are organized wait wait no it's uh, it's to organize the next KOI? Yes so basically my position is the liaison, because KOI is hosted by the youth organizations that is in the country where COP is being hosted. So let's say in this case, the UK. So I need to bridge the information from Yungo as a constituency to this UK organizations to assist them. What do they need in terms of documents, technicalities, or if they need guidance. So I am, this is my role in Yungo. At the same time in KOI, my role is the global affair, lead of global affairs unit. I am the one um, managing all the high level uh, coordination, like talking to UN, talking to the UK government, talking to state governments, assuring that all voice are heard in the, in the local level. So this global affairs doesn't exist before. They call it international mobilization, but only for delegates purposes. But this time, we try to revolutionize by assuring that we are not only involved, we are not only hearing them, but involving them. Let, let's say, for example, our, one of the major output for COI is to produce the youth policy document, which will be forwarded to the UN Climate Change Conference. So our, our idea right now is not only to, for, to get contribution, but to involve them. Like, okay, maybe all universities from your country, we appoint country coordinators. This is like a magnanimous coordination that we do right now to appoint country coordinators. And then, okay, contact all your universities in your country, ask them for contribution to the youth policy document. And then we will summarize it in COI, submit it to conference of parties. So that's how our, I mean, this is like my brainchild putting up the global affairs unit and revolution, revolutionizing it. Could you elaborate on what is KOI and why do you think it's important? Well, KOI is, a, uh, is the, like the annual gathering of Yungo and non-Yungo members. This is like the, um, the biggest and the most substantial youth gathering in the world, I could say, because it is the only youth gathering that has the capacity to influence or to give inputs to the UN climate negotiation process because of the Yungo. So again, Yungo is the constituency, Koi is the event. So we organize Koi, this is like the Yungo event, and then we produce a policy document. So no other event can do that, that can directly contribute. Um, you know, if you know other big youth gatherings in the world, I think they are, they are like, they are doing their own objectives. But for us, we are, we are having the three main components, which is the policy document, skills, skills and uh, capacity building and we also have the you know cultural exchange so 
as I mentioned the policy document earlier in terms of skills and capacity building skills is you know you are spending so much to be in koi and then we want you to go home with a new skill so maybe for example public speaking maybe i can train them maybe i can come up with a workshop like admit 50 youth there and maybe the other workshop is pitching maybe the other workshop is fundraising or event management and for the sessions of course all the all the themes that touch climate change the you know cities we have the sustainable development goals agriculture, you know, everything. We have different sessions with high caliber uh, speakers. I think in the past COI, yes, in the past COI, we have the UN Secretary General, we have Greta Thunberg there, and ministers, big people, because this is the biggest climate youth gathering in the world. So that's to, you know, to encapsulate COI. How many people, young people join the COI? Well, if it's not for pandemic, we can actually gather like thousands of maybe 5,000. In Paris, we are 5,000 delegates. But this time, koi. maybe in the Koi, yeah. Wow. Well, I really, you know, now that you have been, I really regret why why wasn't there? Why wasn't, why didn't I join the Koi in Paris? I was in Paris. You, you grew up in Paris, right? Yes. But no one told me about Koi. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was told about Koi like after it happened. <laughs> We were in par Parc d'Exposition. Yeah, it's so... I yeah. have big FOMO now. <laughs> I will, that, that, I'll try to join. That, that's why I love Paris, Dinlong. I have my, my, my very first moment in climate. I mean, engagement. Paris is very... For me, how, Koi, how Paris Agreement is important to the world right now is how dear Paris to be because of that. Mm. If if we meet, I I always give a small Eiffel Towers to fans of Paris. So Great. I hope I can well, give you one. <laughs> sure, next time. <laughs> I even went back there in 2019. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, for climate change or for for we had the reasons? Student Energy Summit in London okay. in 2019, and I I passed by uh, Paris and Rome. Okay, and. Last question, Koi, but how long does it last? Well, it's usually three days, but I think this time it's going to be four days. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, you really make me, made me want to go to the next Koi. Uh, sure. Cool. Uh, and so, yeah, and so to come back, so, so the main output of the Koi, so it's this policy document, so created by youth with inputs of young people from all over the world. Then what happens to... So it's then I guess someone, what so it's brought during the cup, but concretely like how how is it brought? How is it pitched? Uh... So through Marie Claire and Hita, we will forward our official position to the UNFCCC. Yeah, so encouraging everyone to join Yongo as well. I think uh, I speak for Yongo. At well, it is open not only to Yongo members. It's open to everyone. We have uh, we will open it uh, like publicly. You can see um, it in our social media pages, on our website, in groups. Because one of the one of the missions of our country coordinators is to spread it like across the different uh, platforms worldwide. What is the age limit? Well, as I think the age limit is 35. Okay, so I, uh, it's okay. I can still go. <laughs> How old are you now, Din Long? 27. 27. Oh, okay, okay. Great, interesting. How, how old did you think I was? I thought like you're like 30, 29, 30. <laughs> and I'm younger, younger than you. Uh, yeah, Din Long, I don't know if, um, you know, because I'll be bringing my performers there. Maybe if you have something for us in, in, in Paris, if it's not really that difficult to connect us there, we can pass by. I mean, you know, it's, we are spending a, a lot of money, I mean, off, off, the, off our program, okay? If you have something for us, we can pass by and perform there as well. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, let me think about it. Because I actually, I, I'm... I actually want to go to the COP. 
I don't know how I can go, but I will have to think about it. But, uh, and it's also, yeah, I mean, if I'm in Europe, I will just spend some time in Paris. So, yeah. yeah cool. Join us. Yeah, join us. I will tell yeah. my Claire and Gita. Perfect. Um, cool. I think, no, I think we, we got a good preview of your climate journey. Uh, I have a question that I like to ask about the past. I mean, we've mainly been speaking about the past, but another question about the past is, so you are 28. Uh, 10 years ago, but you entered... 27. 27. Okay, 27. Oh, the same what, age. You, okay. 1993? Yes. Yeah, we're the same age. Okay. Uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, so imagine you can go back in time. 10 years ago, you are 17. So you're just about to, I guess, run. Uh, for the campaign so imagine you are able to tell yourself to tell us to tell something to your younger self uh, would you tell him something and if yes what would you tell the younger Jan okay let, let me think okay before you capture this audio <laughs> <laughs> what would I tell myself um, I, I, I'm, I'm receiving this kind of questions, but I, I wish to nail it. I mean, um, for me, well, the common question here is saying, how would you like to change something in yourself before? So this time is what would you tell yourself? Um, I think because for me, I don't have any regrets. So that's why I don't have any advice for myself in the younger me. I think in a, in a more personal way, I can just say that I wish you can do more so you can touch more lives of the people like what I'm doing right now. Wait, okay, we have to... <laughs> because for me, I'm really contented in law. Like, I, I think I've really done so much in my life. That's why I, I don't know what to say because whatever mistakes that I did before makes me who I am today in terms of leadership, in terms of networking, in terms of, of my perspective. For me, it, was, it is important um, form or building process of who is Jan today. That's why I don't really know what to say in my younger me. Because that, that, uh, the younger me was um, enough for me to, to you know to commit mistakes and be better so i don't know how i'm going to frame that 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 answer yeah no so i mean it's inter i i interviewed uh alinari uh, so she's an amazing person who i ask her this question i ask this question to everyone because i think it's a very interesting way to yeah to for people to reflect and she said you know, she thought about it for one minute and she said, I would tell her, good job. <laughs> so I think right. you, you can tell yourself that also, good job. You're running for presidency. You will get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I now know what to say. So if, if I have to tell myself or if I have to tell something to my younger self, I think I will say to him or to Jan, be strong. Be strong because, you know, the path going forward is really tough. As someone who is from, from, from the province, as someone who is um, unconnected to the vast opportunities and being here right now is really like, moving mountains and going through a lot of difficulties. So I think I will say, I will say that to myself, like be strong. Yeah, it, I think it's a very good point. I mean, beyond saying good, be strong, but the fact that, you know, you come from this Leite. So, because, you know, like when we look at you now, when we meet you or, you know, during a panel, we, we are like, 
Well, John, you know, he's uh, part of Yongo. He's connected to, so he lives in Singapore. He's connected to so many opportunities. He's a very international guy, you know, but I mean, it took you so much effort. And, you know, I, I say that, but I cannot imagine how much effort it took you, but you, you, you were saying, you know, it's like as if you went to Mars three times and you came back. It is like it's really difficult. Um, I don't even appreciate before uh, Din Long why um, why there's a need for you to study in big universities. For us, as long as you finish your degree, that's it. So I mean, again, off the record, when I see your profile that you finish your studies in, how do you say it? Heck, in HEC, yeah, HEC, <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow. I wish I mean I wish I I could study there as well, but I'm 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 broke as fuck. Sorry for me. I'm broke as fuck. <laughs> and I I even even living here in Singapore didn't long. Oh my god, how many tears and how many sleepless nights, um, just for me to finish this. And I really my friends helped me so much, um, just to finish this one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe if I'll be given the chance to work, um, and then go back. And study again, I will, because I get these things are you know in in a, in a real world these are the things that you need to have for you to be in a good position, you know good career or good business. That's it. Otherwise, you will just be in the status quo. So in order for you to influence more people, you need to equip yourself with credibility. And when I see your your profile, I was like, when will be the time that I will be in your position? I mean, I know I have, I do have a lot of of experiences, but I still have dreams and aspirations for myself. I, I think um, um, Din Long in on a more personal sharing, even for me staying in Singapore right now and surviving here, you know, one of the most expensive cities in the world. It's Marie Claire and Hita who looked for a part time job for me, just for me to stay and work for Yungo, because. I think nobody graduated in events management, arts and events management in Yungo. So I'm the only one who is really technical about it. I mean, in Yungo, we don't have... People there are mostly into sciences, engineering, climate, and whatever. It's re very rare to find someone in the arts or in events industry. So I am the only one right now who is pulling off this, um, these technicalities, like in terms of event organizing, in terms of diplomatic coordination, I mean, I had a background in diplomatic ordination because of my job before. So um, in order for me to to stay afloat, in order for, for Koi to exist despite the pandemic, I have to stay here in Singapore because of the internet connection, because of, of accessibility. So it's really difficult, you know, like my day-to-day -day life is, even though I can say that I do have a lot of achievements, but a survivor still surviving. And I wish if I can find really if I can really find a good job, I really wish to study um, into these universities and you know at least achievement of myself. Yeah, no, but I mean I can just say thank you so much for all the efforts that you are doing to bring no no but really you know I mean it. Uh, I think you know what Yongo is doing, and I. I mean, I've been following Yongo. I, I've been actually in the Facebook group for a long time, but I've never done anything. It was just off and off. <laughs> right, uh, right. But I was still always impressed by a few posts I see there. I mean, I feel like you no know, members of Yongo are really people who do what they say and say what they do in terms of climate change. And you know, since ever since I, I now speak a bit more to Hita and Marie Claire, I really understand more and more like the great work that Yongo is doing. So thank you so much for that, for bringing thousands of people to the Koi. Um, and yeah, I think it, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's important that you also share the behind the scenes, right? Uh, and you have all these achievements, you have Yongo, but it, uh, everyday life, it can still be so difficult, but you're still fighting, surviving to, to have this Koi uh, up and running. Yeah, it is really challenging, and especially if you're working with young people. Again, they have the they have the passion, they have the the the, the fire in their hearts, but the skill wise, you have to train them, and it's you know it's it's time taxing. It's 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 really um, sometimes draining. 
you need to let them understand why you need to do this or what are the things that we need to prepare. So I I think because I also believe in the leadership of Marie Claire and Hita, why I accepted the challenge. Like, okay, let's do it. Mm. Yeah. So I, yeah, I wish to see you there as well. Like maybe um, if if not on behalf of your of your um, work, maybe uh, you know individually. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I will. But I think I think again off the record because um, I think Marie Claire and Hita pitch to UNDP for funding for for Koi. I believe so. Okay. Do you know probably to the HQ? And that and that's I don't know. Uh, right now we are. I am working on bringing in people from Southeast Asia because you know again, youth from coming from here it's really challenging to to finance them. So I am look, looking for stakeholders here in Southeast Asia to support the the Southeast Asian youth to be in. Mm. Yeah, you are based in Cambodia now, right? Yes, I mean something. Yeah. So. We are bringing in Cambodian youth as well. Going to, oh. yeah. Yes, well, I mean, I guess the the challenge for you guys is not to identify, but more to bring them, right? Yes, to bring funding. them, funding. That is the yeah. the major problem for Southeast Asia. But hopefully, okay. with the endorsement for yesterday, we got the endorsement from COP 26 Finally, after the yes, I've after seen your post. five. <laughs> After five months of battle and pressure to the UK government, we got it. So, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, I think we're coming towards the end. I've took so much of your time already. Uh, but no I have problem. final two questions that I always end with. Sure, um, sure. Okay, let me, let, let, let's say three. <laughs> so there's one question I really want to ask as well. Uh, so, okay, first one out of three is, where do you see yourself in... Like because you've been, you've done so much already, like what else do you want to achieve? What else do you want to do? Well, for me, I will continue my passion in using the arts as a catalyst or you know as a medium to educate people to to tell stories. I will continue this one because I think for me it is important to bring up opportunities to the youth in my in my town. And I, I wish to see myself leading more, maybe government, maybe international bodies. Let's see if if my destiny will bring me there. Okay, cool. I, I think one aspect I really like about you is you never forget where you come from and you always think about people in later, right? I, I think it's so, so beautiful. You, you know, okay. everything you said, you know, from... It's always I want people in later to know about this. I want to involve them. I want them to, you know. They long because they don't have the opportunities. Like they don't know yeah. how to how to get this. So I need to bring, I need to open doors for them. Otherwise, they will still be the same or yeah, you know, like typical careers and typical situation. So that's why it's important for me to bring the good news to yeah. to these people. Yeah. Yeah, and another deep philosophical question I have <laughs> is how would you like people to remember you uh, or to know you for? I think most people will remember me as someone who is a strong leader, but funny with humor. A John that is caring But, um, wait, <laughs> how do I frame that? I know that I, I, I know that I'm a tough leader, but I am, um, I do have a sense of humor when leading people. I am caring, but at the same time, will really push you to the edge of your, you know, of your capacity, capabilities. And... I want to be remembered as Jan. Um, hmm, this very tough questions. Okay, I was not prepared. <laughs> I, I, I am prepared that I have to tell my stories, but wait, okay. 
let me let me frame it again in better way. One more. <laughs> yeah, wait. Jan, who is a, a a tough leader but have a sense of humor, caring but will push you to the edge of your capabilities, and okay. Okay, I, I want people to remember me as a strong and tough leader, but caring. Uh, sorry. So, okay, one more time. I want people to remember Jan as a tough and strong leader, but have a sense of humor. A Jan that is caring, but will push you to the edge of your capabilities. And I think above all, I want them to remember a Jan that will not stop moving forward. Cool, yes, yeah, so this one was perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And do you think you are there already? I can say I'm on my way. Okay. And uh, yeah, last one. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be easier or harder <laughs> for you, uh, but yeah, cool. if you had to describe yourself in three hashtags, what would that be? Three hashtags. Can you give me examples of other? Uh, so the last one, she said, hashtag Malaysian, hashtag happy, hashtag environmentalist. Okay, I'm typing mine for it. Wait. Okay, so I think mine is... Hashtag keep moving forward. Hashtag raise your flag. Hashtag unifying for change. Nice. And I see you are, you're very organized <laughs> and structured. I mean, you always take <laughs> notes before you speak, right? Oh, no, I mean, I just wanted to be like on the punch because I know that when in, in PR perspective, we need to capture these lines and then post it somewhere. Or maybe when people are will be hearing me I want them to remember those lines. So I'm always trying to be on that point. Okay. No, I'm sure they will remember. Uh, cool. And final, final, final question. But where where can people reach out to you? And why should they contact you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm all over this um, the social media. I mean, the digital space. I am in LinkedIn. Jan Carol Cabalona Guillermo. I am in Facebook. I am in in. Instagram, I am in Twitter. If they wish to contact me via email, my email is um, ceo at unifyph.org. And why they need to contact me? Because I think we should do something to make things better in general, whether it could be personally, whether it could be for our communities. Cool. So... Yeah, so Jan all over the internet and um, contact him for any speaking opportunities. I think he's enjoying it now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish, I wish I, I, I have a lot of, I, feel I can split myself and share these stories to a lot of people. Um, even when I'm going to cities in the Philippines, sometimes I have to, to conceal myself because a lot of friends loves to hear my stories and how, how you know it's comforting to connect it's comforting to to uplift their their lives from from my from my sharing and so i wish i uh, i could bring this story to more to more people and uh, i i do have a lot of stories to tell it's just that our questions are very structured in a way so i have to give like the the gist of it but as as i think as we go along the way in long we have a lot of things to to talk about Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, for me, it was really nice to reconnect, connect, reconnect uh, with you. Uh, and maybe you could, uh, you can start a, a talk show in Tagalog for all your friends in the Philippines, no? I mean, uh, it could be a solution. Let's see. Uh, maybe after my mission in the global space, maybe local next time. <laughs> Actually, you know, um, Do you know 2030 Youth Force uh, Philippines? Oh, well, it's so sad. I am not really connected to a Philippine context. 
because okay. it's more uh, sorry to say this it's more in the in the capital opportunity sometimes is very difficult if you are from far away of, of manila yeah yeah no definitely yeah that's yeah, why no, when, just, yeah the, the, you see the the audience in our talk like they were like saying oh the filipinos because maybe because they don't know me in in, in the capital yeah but uh, yeah no i just wanted to share like uh so one of our colleagues he's also he's uh he's host he's um how to say i think he's a radio host or something so he's always sharing his stories i think for filipino audience and it works super well so i'm sure you could do that as well <laughs> sure hopefully um but yeah, you know thank chat. you Thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed this talk, even though we had so much from my side technical issues. I mean, the audience will not hear it because I will rem yeah. remove everything, but just, just wanted to share my just removed, Just remove other areas that are like um, not necessary. No, I think everything is necessary. You know, it's also your thought <laughs> process. And I want people to hear everything, but I will remove all the time I screamed. <laughs> Because I was frustrated. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, I mean, hope to see you in next programs and maybe in Scotland or in Paris. Let's see what we can oh, yes. do. <laughs> yes. See you in Europe. Yeah. See you in Europe. Congrats for listening until the end of this episode. Of course, to best support Lifeline, you can share this episode to two of your friends and subscribe to the next episodes on any platform. See you next time.